So the title of my presentation uh, is SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic. So maybe with a couple of definitions right off the top. So just like HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19. So COVID-19, which is what everyone is, is kind of referring to the virus as, it's actually the disease caused uh, by the virus. But I'll probably use both terms in, in interchangeably. So let's talk a little bit about coronaviruses. Um, this is, these are amongst the largest RNA viruses uh, in biology. And there are four of these coronaviruses that have been circulating amongst us for a very long period of time, causing the common cold. Um, and it, it probably cause about 10 to 30% of the common colds, upper respiratory tract infections. But then in 2002, something else happened. Then emerged the first uh, kind of deadly uh, coronavirus called SARS. You probably remember this. Uh, back just at the turn of the century, there were about 8,000 people uh, infected, and there were 774 deaths, so, so about a 9% uh, death rate. Then in 2012, there was a, a, the emergence of the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome, and that turned out to be, it's a slower, it hasn't infected as many individuals, but it carries almost a, over a 30% uh, mortality rate. So it's not a good virus to get at all. So it was in the setting of both of these coronaviruses and the small outbreaks that they occurred that the third, the third uh, virus emerges, and that is uh, COVID-19 or the SAR caused by the SARS-CoV-2. At this point in time today, uh, according to the Hopkins uh, uh, tracking uh, website, there have been essentially about 1.6 million people infected. And we don't think that we're counting everyone yet that's infected. And there have been over 95,000 deaths, as you know. This uh, virus has brought the world to a ground stop. Uh, we are, uh, it's really remarkable what this respiratory virus, the, the havoc that it has created uh, in our lives and in our economies. Um, and we are defenseless. We are defenseless in that we have no immunity to this virus, we have no antivirals yet, and we don't have a vaccine yet. But this is gonna be a triumph of science. Just wait and see. So where did this disease come from? In fact, it came from the horseshoe bat. This bat houses or is home to over 60 different coronaviruses. And intermittently, a virus can escape from the bat and enter, a, enter an animal host. For example, SARS came from the palm civet, a cat uh, that was infected with this bat virus. And then that, bat, that, that palm civet passed the virus onto humans and that created the SARS outbreak. MERS was caused by another virus coming into dromedary camels and then transferred to humans. And now this COVID-19 is not quite sure, there's a question mark here, whether or not the pangolin, this mammalian anteater, is actually the intermediary host. Uh, but there's a virus that is 96% um, similar to COVID-19 in the horseshoe bat, and there's a virus even more similar in the pangolin. So one makes, one thinks about the pangolin possibly being the intermediary host, but that's not proven yet. So these are all what we call zoonoses, zoonotic from kind of zoo or animal transmissions into the human population. Most of the, uh, most of the diseases that we're encountering now, for example, HIV was a zoonosis that came from, uh, uh, from chimpanzees. Uh, most of the emerging viral diseases are in fact uh, zoonoses. So as I was mentioning, when we don't have any immunity, we have no antivirals, we have no vaccine, our only way of dealing with a, a virus like this is to test, test, test. 
And what you're, the testing is designed to allow you to identify the individuals who are infected and then and their contacts and then to quarantine all of those individuals. And then that's, that kind of, a, of approach allows society to continue to function because you're pulling people out of, of the larger population if they have the disease and anyone who might have, they, that may have infected. Unfortunately, we missed that opportunity as we'll see. Then in fact, if the virus breaks out in, within a community, the only thing you have is rigorous social distancing, the kind of shelter in place or stay at home uh, type of order that we're under now. In this setting, businesses are shuttered, schools are closed, only essential services are provided. And of course, it can be devastating for an economy, but it is an effective way of people avoiding becoming infected with a, a highly infectious virus. So different approaches and different results have been taken around uh, the world. China, where the, 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 virus, the viral infection occurred in a small seafood um, market in Wunan, the Wunan market in Wuhan, China. And this probably event probably occurred in early December that there was a transmission from some intermediary host or perhaps directly from the bat into humans and it took off. Um, China was hyper aggressive in dealing with this respiratory virus. Um, they, uh, uh, they quarantined several major cities, millions and millions of people. Uh, they did excess, excessive uh, hyper aggressive testing and isolating those individuals and all of their contacts. And they were able to, uh, although the virus spread to virtually every province in China, um, by their reports, only 82,000 people uh, uh, were infected and about 3,000, it's uh, oh, about a little more than 3,500 uh, deaths. So <clears throat> very aggressive approach. South Korea, where the virus spread to, massive testing. And they got reasonable control of their virus, as did Hong Kong, as did Singapore, testing and selective use of quarantine. In contrast, Italy kind of neglected the virus. They had limited testing. They were late to the uh, kind of the social distancing, et cetera. And they've had one heck of a bad time uh, with this virus, with physicians having the health systems being overwhelmed and physicians having to make decisions about who gets the last ventilator. Spain, a similar poor response. Now the United States, um, I have to say that uh, uh, we blew it. We blew it from the point of view that we were not ready in terms of having in place all of the testing that we needed to deploy when this virus first hit our shores. You probably recall that it was first uh, seen in Washington and then in California and then a few cases in New York. I mean, if we had had a sophisticated testing system and quarantining uh, a program, we could have potentially contain the virus like South Korea did, like Hong Kong did, like Singapore did. Uh, but in fact, we did not. Uh, well, it, with, some with some circumstances, uh, we've had fa more favorable outcome. I would show you the situation or compare the situation between New York and San Francisco. In San Francisco, we moved to a shelter in place order uh, in, in the Bay Area three days before New York did. Now there, and then, and you can see the difference, uh, the, the difference in these outbreaks or the epidemic, the pandemic in San Francisco is there are like 50 cases a day. The health, the health systems are not being overwhelmed. Infection rates are, are you know, looks like it's going down. It, it's, it's an amazing, not only have we flattened the curve here in the Bay Area, we've crushed it. That's the early, that's the early assessment. In contrast, New York, which is, albeit a more dense population, it also is now clear that the virus in New York came principally from Europe, not China, based on uh, genetic sequencing. There was also at least one person in New York who was what's called a super spreader, an individual who was particularly shedding large quantities of virus documented to have infected at least 113 other individuals 
and then it's just an exponential spread of the virus from that point in time. But they were three days later into their into their lockdown, and they are their system is on the edge of being overwhelmed. Have you seen? Finally, deaths continue to go up. Between, uh, you know, uh, over 700 deaths a day now occurring in New York City. Um, but there seems the hospitalizations, as you've heard, are, are starting to level off, uh, which is very good news. They may be reaching a plateau of, of sorts. So let's talk a little bit about these the different viruses. So on the x-axis here, you see the number of transmissions per infection. So that is if one person is infected, how many people does that person spread the virus to? And then on the y-axis is the fatality rate. How deadly is the virus? So you see, in fact, out here on the in terms of the highest number of transmissions per infection is the measles. Measles can spread like wildfire because it, it spreads in the air in an aerosol. Highly, highly transmissible. Chickenpox, also highly transmissible, but not as lethal as the measles. Now, we look, we look at the more lethal viruses, we look at bird flu, we look at Ebola, we look at smallpox, SARS, Sp the Spanish flu of 1918. We see that those viruses ap appear to be more, uh, 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 their lethality rate is higher than with SARS-CoV-2. And I would say that we're not quite sure what the ultimate mortality rate will be with SARS-CoV-2 because we don't know the total number of people infected. All we know is the number of people who, who uh, either are tested or come to the hospital with, with, with this pneumonia, et cetera. So we're probably underestimating the total number of infections. Right now, worldwide, I think it's running at about 5.4% mortality. And I think that could come down to between a half a percent and 1% when we count everybody who actually was infected. The seasonal flu um, has about a 0.1% mortality rate. Um, so I think this virus is clearly going to be higher, five to tenfold at least, higher than the, the seasonal uh, influenza. So that gives you an idea where this particular respiratory virus sits. I think that in general, it's probably being spread. Be, uh, it's with what's called the R naught, the the how many people will one infected person spread it to. There are estimates it's between 2.2 and 3.5. Um, this is a highly infectious uh, virus. And it's also, I think, a sticky virus that can persist on surfaces and be transmitted from surfaces as, as well, in addition to respiratory droplets, although surface transmission is a small, small component of overall transmission. So where do we stand in terms of drugs and vaccines? There are many antiviral drug candidates that are now in trials. Uh, in fact, the, one of the most promising is remdesivir, a drug that Gilead developed. Uh, it uh, attacks the RNA polymerase of the, of the coronavirus. They tried it in Ebola. It didn't work as well as the other treatments that were developed for Ebola, but it is showing activity um, in, uh, in, with these coronaviruses. There are five trials which should report out here in the next, five, uh, next few days. Um, hopefully we'll learn about remdesivir and how effective it is in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, there, are, there are the, I think the, we'll also find out about toxicities of this drug. There are suggestions that it does have some hepatotoxicity. It's not clear whether that will be a limiting toxicity in terms of its, of its use. Um, there are many vaccine candidates that are being, oh, uh, other drugs. Um, let me just say that hydroxychloroquine, uh, an anti-malarial and also an anti-rheumatic drug, um, it is being touted by our president. Uh, however, there is a very, there is essentially no uh, clinical data supporting uh, uh, that clearly shows that it, 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 it works. It may. And, but we just need to do the clinical trials. It is not, a, it's not a, a drug that you would want to take unless you have to. I mean, there are cardiac toxicities, there are other toxicities of this drug. So uh, there are now formal trials underway looking at hydroxychloroquine, as well as some of the repurposing of some HIV drugs like the protease inhibitors, uh, lopinavir and, and ritonavir. 
vaccines. This is the solution. A vaccine, a safe and effective vaccine is the solution to the coronavirus challenge that we face. We have no immunity, we need the immunity. And we probably need to be able to make good antibodies as well as mount good T cell responses. That's what we learned in terms of the control of the SARS virus uh, and the MERS virus. Um, the, um, the, the, there are gonna be many shots on goal. There are lots of vaccine candidates being developed. Um, there was one that's uh, Moderna is a, a company that makes an RNA vaccine. This, they can move very rapidly since they just encapsulate the RNA in a lipid, in a lipid um, a vesicle and then inoculate with that. They were from the time the Chinese published the sequence of the virus in early January, 42 days later, they had a GMP product that was in people's arms undergoing safety trials. Kind of a record uh, of, of speed. But many vaccines will be, you'll hear about them. Now, part of the problem is how to test. Uh, the testing, uh, I think we can establish safety pretty quickly, but testing and showing efficacy of a vaccine is a slower process. Uh, I think that you're going to see a movement toward direct human testing, where there'll be human volunteers who, who take these vaccines and then are intentionally inoculated with the virus. This can immensely speed up vaccine uh, uh, development. Um, and NIH is already doing this with a, a particular influenza uh, vaccine that they're, they're trying now. Um, so it's, this is a, you know, this, this is not, normally you would put the vaccine out in a community and then people would become naturally infected and you would look for an effect, but that takes much longer to show efficacy. Uh, so I think we may see a very different type of uh, rapid testing of, of vaccine effectiveness by uh, people volunteering. And hopefully by then we'll have antivirals that will work and we will identify individuals who are at very low risk for serious disease, et cetera, so that to minimize the, the, the risks. Um, so what is Gladstone doing? So um, I'll just summarize briefly here. So uh, Melanie Ott and Jennifer Doudna. Uh, Jennifer Doudna is the, the, the woman who you may have heard of that has uh, discovered the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system. Well, they're using CRISPR in a different Cas protein to now develop a rapid diagnostic test. And this rapid diagnostic test might actually hook up to your iPhone. And so it could be a home test, although, and, and it's attracted a lot of interest from the Department of Defense and Amazon and others. Um, uh, that's what we need. We need very much. We need point of care rapid testing to identify infected individuals. I mean, it hardly does any good to get tested and then have to wait seven days for, your, for the results. My own lab is looking at ways of how to block this virus from getting into cells in the first place. We know that this virus, uh, it uses its spike protein to bind to the ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, receptor. And for example, we are now looking at a peptide created by an MIT chemist that uh, is purported to block the binding of the receptor to the spike protein and thus could prevent the entire infection process. Really, I like the idea of nipping this in the bud before the virus even establishes itself within, within the cell. We're also looking at another peptide to block the fusion of the virus where it gets into the cytoplasm. And that particular, those particular uh, peptides um, have the advantage that they work against all coronaviruses. And, you know, in 18 years, we've had three coronaviruses come at us. Um, you know, so I can do the math. In another six years, there might be another one uh, emerging. So I think coming up with pan-coronavirus therapies would be very helpful. Um, Nevin Krogan, uh, whose work has been reported in the New York Times recently, has taken every coronavirus gene product every protein and mapped its interaction with every host protein. And by understanding that map has come up with several drug candidates that are being tested. Leora Weinberger is trying to use a fake virus, a mini me, if you will, of the coronavirus. 
that will steal all the nutrients and will steal, it will deny the coronavirus's chance to actually grow and, and replicate. Uh, it's called a therapeutic interfering particle. Uh, Melanie and I are also working on the, light, the late stages of coronavirus disease. You may have heard about this, that patients, that they often will decompensate, that they will be some, they'll actually, actually be in, uh, improving, things are going good, and then all of a sudden they decompensate. And in general, this is often associated with an overly vigorous host response against the virus. Uh, so it's the host that almost turns on itself and it leads to this cytokine storm, all these inflammatory mediators are released, um, and it leads to the acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, and lung failure. So we're looking at ways to interrupt that uh, cytokine storm and, uh, and emergence of ARDS. So that gives you a little bit of a, of a sense of the types of things. I can tell you that so many investigators here have turned their programs on a dime to focus on COVID-19. We view this as really a, 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 as, a, as a challenge of our lifetime. I thought HIV was my challenge of my lifetime. Uh, this one, this is a fast mover. This is a virus that has swept around this world in three short months. Um, and it requires, and you know, science will be the, our way out of this. We will get antivirals, we will get a vaccine, and it would be nice if this virus shows a little bit of seasonality to give us a little bit more time to develop uh, those agents. So what can you do right now? I mean, it's, the, you know, it's all kind of public health stuff. Uh, you can stay home, protect, you know, isolate yourself from other people, break this transmission chain. Do not, do not give this virus a place to go. If you're out, stay six feet from others. That six feet is because of these respiratory droplets that they can't get, they can't travel. These large droplets can't uh, travel more than six feet. But there's increasing information now that the virus may be moving in smaller droplets, less than five microns, which is called an aerosol. And that's now, and that plus the fact that there may be asymptomatic individuals who are perfectly fine, but they're shedding virus. And so that's why it is now important when you're out to wear a mask, wear a mask in public. You should, of course, the most probably the most important thing you can do is to wash your hands frequently for 20 seconds. This is a virus that gets on your hands and then you put your hand on your face, you, inoc you self inoculate yourself. Uh, so wash your hands, keep your hands off your face. I think it's like 20, uh, the average is something like I read 27 times an hour we touch our face. <laughs> I can imagine, I, you know, I was kind of counting to myself the other day when I was sitting at my desk how many times I wanted to reach for my face and, and didn't. It's a lot. Um, and then the idea that, that this, this virus can transmit off of surfaces. Um, so decontaminating things like uh, this virus can live on stainless steel or plastic, et cetera. Um, you want to make sure that I treat every surface that I come with outside of the home as contaminated, like the, a doorknob here at the Institute. I, it's contaminated. Um, and so I act accordingly in terms of, uh, of taking precautions, washing my hands a lot, et cetera. All the groceries are decontaminated with uh, uh, solutions that will inactivate the virus. So with that, I will simply end um, and thank you for attending tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have.